Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. There's pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord indeed. Thank you, praise team. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Hey, it's great to see you here this morning on this day in St. George where it looks like it's trying to rain at least. So we pray for the rain, but pray for yes. a good rain. Not the rain that Bob and Diane got, but a good rain to come and just bless the earth. So we're so glad you could join us. Oh, hey, hey, welcome to Shepherd of the Hills for the second week of our eight-part sermon series. It's about heroes of the Bible, arms of strength and feet of clay. And today, Reverend Michael is going to be talking about Esther, the Esther the courageous, Esther the one who persevered, Esther the one who had few flaws from what we see. So it's going to be a great time and he's got a great sermon lined up for you. We're so glad you could join us. I'll tell you what, why don't you go ahead and stand up if you're able, greet your neighbor, say hello. And <laughs> Hello again. <laughs> hey, Tom. Good. All right, Praise Team's got some more great songs for you. 
two. Time three, is up. Play. <laughs> to the Lord for forever is how he brings us life. Each and every day is an opportunity to be reminded that tomorrow is in God's hands. Come on, let's do it.
you sound great this morning, partially because we know not only are we blessed to be a blessing, but we're blessed by the Lord God in order to accomplish that task. So blessed be that gracious Lord. seated. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty indeed. As we prepare our hearts and minds for this time of prayer, let us remember the words of the psalmist who encourages us to, as he says, come to let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God and we are the people of His pasture, the flock under His care. So dear friends, let us in spirit bow down and kneel before the Lord our Maker in silent prayer. Almighty God, our everlasting Father, we thank You. We thank You for all the good things in life, for our Holy Scriptures tell us that all good things come from You. You know, we don't thank You enough for all of our blessings, but help us through the power of the Holy Spirit to indeed thank You with an open heart. We thank You for the gathering of families that are taking place this summer, for the safe trips that have been had in the travels, that the reunions with others, and just the joy of being together in fellowship after a long time, after a pandemic. And we thank You, Lord, for new births. We thank You for just another day to be on this earth, 
to do your will, to soak in the sun, and yes, to even feel the rain from time to time. We just thank you for the opportunity to worship, to gather together, to worship in your name, and to worship you. So dear Father, we love you. And we come here again to worship you, our great triune God, for only you are worthy of our worship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We continue to praise your holy name. We continue to thank you. And we do so as we pray the prayer that your Son, Jesus, the risen Christ, our Lord, that he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. As we prepare for this time of the giving of our tithes and offerings, if you'd note the attendance paths are in the end chairs, if you'd take them out and fill them out and perhaps meet a friend you haven't met before. And the usher, please come forward. <laughs> pray dear lord you are indeed more precious to us than silver or gold and we do come to you today as your humble servants we thank you and with the heart of gratitude we return to you a portion of what you've entrusted to us may you bless it may you multiply it and may these funds these gifts these tithes and offerings be used for your glory and your glory alone we pray this in your son's precious name christ jesus the lord amen and an amen. I invite you, please, be seated. Let's let's take a moment and look at our scripture found in Esther. Now, of course, Esther is a story that has many components, but we're going to kind of focus in on this this part about the king Haman, Esther, and Mordecai. So, let's take a look at Esther seven one through ten and nine ten through twenty. So the king and Haman went in to feast with Queen Esther. And on the second day, as they were drinking wine, the king again said to Esther, What is your petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted to you. What is your request? Even into, unto half my kingdom it shall be fulfilled. 
Then Queen Esther answered, oh, if I've won your favor, O king, and it pleases you, king, let my life be given to me. That is my petition and the wives of my people. That is my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have held my peace. But no enemy can compensate for this damage to the king. King Ahasuerus then said to Queen Esther, Who is he? Who is he? The one who presumes to do this. Esther says, A foe and an enemy, this wicked Haman. And then Haman was suddenly terrified before the king and the queen. The king rose from the feast in wrath and went into the palace garden. But Haman stayed to beg his life from Queen Esther, for he saw that the king had determined to destroy him. And when the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman had thrown himself on the couch where Esther was reclining. And the king said, would he even assault the queen in my presence in my own house? As the words left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs in attendance for the king, said, look, the very gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai, whose word saved the king, stands at Haman's house, 50 cubits high. And the king said, hang him on that. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the anger of the king abated. Mordecai recorded these things and sent letters to all the Jews who were in all the providences of King Ahasuerus, both near and far, enjoining them that they should keep the 14th day of the month, Adar and the 15th day of the same month, year by year. The word of God for the people of God. Let's join together for a moment of prayer. May the words of my mouth and meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You are our rock and redeemer. Speak to us of the gift of perseverance, but also remind us that there is an opportunity each and every day for us to measure ourselves. And may we always find that even in those moments when we're wanting, we have an opportunity to repent, to once again find the inversion that leads us back to you. Bless us in the name of Christ, we pray. And God's people said, amen. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it is still July. Good news is you get Tim for the next couple weeks. He's going to tell good, bad jokes. Me. Oh, man. Why didn't the pony sing lullabies? She was a little horse. Ah. You know, I, I recently heard that people, some people eat, eat snails. And I immediately thought, well, what, do they not like fast food? All right, Daryl, knock, knock, <laughs> hatch. Oh, bless you. Uh, <laughs> What's the tallest building in the world? It's a library because it has so many stories. Mm, man. Make him stop, make him stop. Where does sheep go on vacation? The Bahamas. See why I pray for you at the beginning of the sermon? Yeah. I ran across about a year and a half ago while we were down at the Mountain West Tournament that there was a Las Vegas mob museum. And during that time, I thought, gosh, we should go find the mob museum. Well, Lori and I wandered out and we were looking for it and it's kind of hard to find. But one of these days I'm going to go because, hey, I like museums and the museum about the mob sounds kind of interesting because there's a lot of artifacts. There's all of these pieces from really all around 
around the country that testify to the viciousness of mob life. It's a museum that, well, it kind of lifts up the bad guys, you know, and I don't know if that's always a good thing, but it does remind us that in the midst of our human experience, there are some people that, well, they may not simply just struggle through life, but they bring that struggle to others. And, and that's kind of tough. And most of the time we always have to understand that folks like, like our mobsters that are immortalized in the mob museum, they pay a very heavy price for their choice of profession. Now we wind up here coming to a, uh, place where we remember every century has its roll call of infamous and even the scriptures have a reminder that there's a lot of good people, wonderful people who stand with strength. And Reverend Tim and I are talking about the, the humanness of them. But not only are there people who are going to do the best for God and still have a human, human uh, faults and foibles, there are some, some characters in the scriptures that are downright rotten. They're rotten to the core. And 5th BC was no uh, no exception. Esther, Esther, Queen Esther, she's a beautiful Hebrew daughter who becomes a queen. That story is interesting in and of itself. So if you had the chance to read, you, you recognize the, the, what, the talent and the beauty that this woman represents is a, it's a magnet. And so she becomes a queen and she finds that palace intrigue is not just simply annoying, but at times it can become downright deadly. Her enemy, of course, is one of our infamous. He is a man named Haman, and he's the palace villain. He's managed to organize an empire, and that in and of itself will tell you the shadiness of this character, to organize an empire to carry out an evil plan to eliminate not just one Hebrew soul, but all of them. So, in this lectionary uh, reading cuts to the chase with the snippets of seven and nine, and it brings this it, this entire book into a focus because, of course, Haman, who is high rank in the Persian Empire, he's angered initially. He's angered because Mordecai refuses to show him any uh, obeisance. He just says, I, I am a Hebrew. I worship the one God. And, of course, in the midst of that, Haman, who people are supposed to stand and, and revere, um, he, he's furious. He's absolutely furious. And so Haman starts with more Mordecai, but eventually he moves to that place where his anger burns so hotly that the entire Jewish diaspora is at, at his mercy. And Xerxes, Hazarus is also known as Xerxes, uh, issues an edict und without even really knowing it. Haman has one of those moments where he comes in and says, hey, hey uh, king, would you sign all these papers? Don't look at that one. Don't look at that one. <laughs> you know, just sign. It's all good. I got it covered. And unfortunately, this edict passes. And so... Mordecai, who had already served the king in a wonderful role by pointing out some things that were happening and at one point helping to preserve his life, uh, he is the uncle of Esther. And she, of course, is not making a big deal of that. She's just simply being a queen. And because of that, she is put into a position where this edict comes out and she now has to make a decision. It's a risky move to go to the king when you're uninvited. It is important that she goes to him, however, because at the time, nobody was making a big deal about her ethnicity. But... When she discovers that the Hebrews are about to be destroyed, she knows she has to do something about it. And the king, of course, when asked for help, loves Esther, and at that point winds up reversing the edict in a way that, of course, allowed the Hebrews to protect themselves. So in doing so, it kind of 
it thwarted the uh, very threat. And in the end, Haman, Haman who had make a, made a big deal about setting up these gallows, of course, he was in a place where he wound up on those gallows himself. The engine that drives this story is reversal, uh, something that uh, Sidney White Crawford calls ironic reversal. Uh, our expected outcomes are reversed, and the status of various parties undergoes a sudden shift, and they're pretty significant. So Vashti, the, one of the other queens who basically had Xerxes' eyes until Esther showed up, she becomes one who is banished as she tries to thwart Esther, but winds up getting caught in her own trap. Esther is a humble orphan who becomes a powerful queen, not just at a time, but at the right time to stave off disaster for his people. Haman, who swings high and mighty, filled with pride and boasts, becomes the guy who just is swinging mighty high. And then, of course, Mordecai, Haman's targeted victim, becomes the vizier of the empire rather than Haman. And the Jews, diaspora Jews, those whose destruction had been san sanctioned by royal edict, become the victors over their enemies. So um, the world is in many ways turned upside down. And of course, most commentators who celebrate this book are, are often quick to point out that the book of Esther makes no direct reference to God. It's a beautiful example of what we Wesleyans call provenient grace. That idea that God is working even when we are not having to say the words or point out the, the truth or the glory or in that context of salvation to make a point about salvation. God is at work, even when we fail to notice. And that's the beauty of Esther. Provenient grace prevails. And of course, this reversal motif also runs through Jesus' teachings. His parables, you know, they're driven by ironic reversal. The Good Samaritan parable, where the priest and the Levite, belonging to society's upper crust, turn their backs on the beaten man on the roadside while the despised Samaritan comes to his aid. The rich man and Lazarus story, where the rich man who has basked in his glory his whole life and walked past Lazarus every single day finds himself inverted with nothing but pain and suffering while the beggar Lazarus is taken to the paradise. The Pharisee and the tax collector, the tax collector who winds up pay, proclaiming his goodness and celebrating how faithful he is. And of course, the Pharisee who is humble. And of course, in the midst of all, I'm sorry, I got that backwards. <laughs> the Pharisee who's praying in the temple, the boastful prayer. Uh, and of course, the tax collector who brings the humble prayer. And that brings him justification. So Jesus is familiar with this ironic twist. And of course, Esther lives that story to a T. And it's a great reversal that, of course, we find a, an opportunity to see that the Jews had been set up. There were people who were going to overpower them and, and kill them. And yet, of course, as 9 1, Esther 9 1 says, the tables were turned. And the Jews got the upper hand. The Hebrews got the upper hand over those who hated them. And we have to remember that even though some of the reversal talk in the Bible is about ultimate outcomes, there's how things are going to be in the kingdom of God that is to come. There's still a realization that some of it's designed to help us see that in working to reverse wrongs, now in this time and this place, it's accomplished by living righteously. In that sense, one scene from Esther's story does fit. And of course, as an agent of reversal, um, she gets the opportunity to go and be before the king. And in doing so, she admits that I'm taking a huge risk. And in doing so, I will recognize 
that even though it's against the law, I will visit him. And if I perish, I will perish. Because Esther knows that there's trickery, chicanery taking place. And it is fascinating how instead of wasting time and emotion on the injustice of it all, she sets a course of courage that will require as much subtlety from her as the one who set that very trap. This is part of the challenge because, of course, uh, Esther sees this through because she's able to cling to the power of truth and faithfulness and in doing so bring deliverance to her people. But now it's for that feet of clay. Uh, I was telling Tim, I told you all last week, she's pretty idolized in the text. No, not much that you can look at and point to that show a lot of weakness on Esther's part. She's a courageous and intelligent individual who, of course, is set into her position not to simply reap the benefits of being queen, but to serve a purpose in delivering her people, a purpose that she accomplishes. Haman, however, he's another story. He's petty, self-absorbed, he's hateful, and he's spiteful. He feels entitled to position, to adulation, to access, and to privilege. His response to Mordecai shows him demanding of others and yet not recognizing that there are moments in which we negotiate this life's experience in relationship, not by emotions, but by a context. In his case, a small slight at an affront just grows and grows and grows. And of course, he's feeding the emotions of spite and un umbrage without really rectifying the situation. And accordingly, that becomes so unsatisfying because it just builds and builds. And eventually, Haman not only blames Mordecai, but that bitterness grows to the point where his wrath falls upon the whole Jewish community. Only the many can pay for such an affront. The terrible suffering that is caused by, of course, generalization. That's what happens when we generalize, unfortunately. It denies the immediacy of the relationship. It denies us focus and, of course, the reminder that reconciliation occurs in a reciprocal way rather than just simply the moment of, you need to tell me you're sorry. It is, it's an opportunity to see that when we generalize, we dehumanize. And I, I guess that's one of the elements that's, that I struggle with so much now. And, being an avid generalizer sometimes, I'd love to be in that place where thinking about characteristics of people and the way we work, there are some categories that we fall in. However, one of the grave challenges with generalization is it gives us a chance to obliterate not just one voice, but a whole bunch of voices. And then we stop listening. We stop learning. We stop growing. And of course, in that, we lose the inversion. We lose that moment of repentance when we can actually see what is burning within us. Now, let's be honest here. Haman is a very prideful man. He's been building pride for a lot of years. So when he builds a gallows, he doesn't just build a spot. He builds a big one so the whole neighborhood can see. He, of course, reminds people of his greatness and how he has achieved and how he has overcome and how he is someday going to stand by the side of the king. Mordecai becomes his thorn in the side. And of course, in the midst of that generalization, he moves it out from not just Mordecai makes me mad, but those People make me mad. And in doing so, he concocts a plan that will destroy, yes, not just Mordecai, but a lot of other people who weren't even involved with this circumstance. And that's how you lose perspective. And in doing so, we lose relationships and we eventually miss opportunities for service. These reversals are important, and Jesus calls us to adopt a me operandi, and you know, to move from a me operandi, all for me, to a we operandi of reversal. It's, it's about us. This is about us. What we do, how we work, how we live, it is about something that is greater and vast, 
something that evokes a sense of presence that is not just simply motivated by what I get out of the picture, but rather what we're going to accomplish. And, that, and the reason this is important is because things can change quickly. Reversals happen in a hurry. People in Germany are discovering that as their houses and their cars are washing down the middle of roads. People who are suffering because of wildfires right now are learning that things happen unexpectedly and can change in a hurry. What was one moment of contentment in the living room surrounded by all the memories of life in its fullness can be taken away by simply a spark that becomes a bonfire. It can happen quickly. It can happen quickly. And in order for us to remember that that time may come when we not only need others, we have to be prepared to be in that place where we provide what others need. And that's an amazing opportunity for us. So when we move past what it is that we have and start to share and start to care, we're marked with that greater purpose. We become those people who recognize that changes may happen quickly, but we stand on a solid ground, a ground that will find succor and comfort and hope and grace. Unless, of course, we decide we'd rather be like old Haman up there because his clay feet remind us that if we chase the crowns and the glory, if we fail to remember that Paul in Philippians is saying, remember, think of others as better than you. And in doing so, embody the very humility of Christ that is born from the heavens as he crosses the divide between the kingdom of heaven and the place of earth as Christ is incarnated. If we fail to remember those things, we wind up like Haman literally hung by the news that we set for another. Treachery and arrogance blinding us to the place that we actually connect with lots of people who aren't like us. And that is a beautiful thing. Esther welcomes this elevation, and in doing so, she sees it not as a place of pride, but rather a sign for her purpose to be fulfilling. She uses her gifts and grace to bring hope and deliverance to all of her people. She's not just queen. She is truly one who is born for such a time as this. And of course, because of this gentleness, this intelligence, she provides a way through which the people can survive. Now, Haman, of course, just when you think you're something, beware, because ironic, diverse, ironic reversal will come to you. Just when you think you have everything, just when you have reached the pinnacle of all the achievements and accomplishments that you so longed for, the realization is that ironic reversal can come our way so quickly, and with it the loneliness that becomes our daily bread and the self-adulation, it vanishes into the breeze. Out of the dust we are formed and to that dust we shall return. Unless, of course, you choose the strength of Esther, seeing all that you are and all that you have, position, possessions, relationships, and accolade as an opportunity to extend grace, to, to bring to fruition God's greatest hope for humanity, and bringing forth a deeper vision about how God's glorious kingdom works. Well, if you remember that, then you have been made to live a life that meets every moment with courage. And then suddenly you can remember that perhaps you were born for such a time as this. Bring joy, bring grace, and remember your purpose is bound up in him. Let's pray. Who you are and what you share, God, is so abundantly, abundantly rich. 
And yet so often we are content to mark it as our own and to claim it as our legacy or as our our work. But yeah, here we are, God, ready for you to remind us that like Queen Esther, when we have a place for others, when we have a vision that manifests itself by connecting us with those who are like us and those who are not like us, suddenly the world is it's bigger and broader and we're able to envision what your kingdom come is actually going to look like. Help us to be strong in that glory and bring us the grace to one another so that we may stand firm upon your foundation of hope. Be our rock this day in the name of Christ, we pray and God's people said. Amen. All right, let's take a look at some of our opportunities for this week. Pat's last section of the Bible study, the women's Bible study is concluding this week. So we are grateful that she's not only had a great class, but I hope that it's been an opportunity for you to not only finish up, but be prepared for the next class that's coming. Soup Kitchen on Friday the 23rd, 9 a.m. at Switchpoint. Randy Sane is driving that, and he's doing such a wonderful job. So call the office if uh, I believe he's full for this week, but uh, be on the lookout because the signups do pass around, and we'll get back into that routine as we hit the fall so that you can be a part of that as well. Backpacks for Kids needs lots of help in filling backpacks August 5th and 6th. You can sign up in the Narthex. Talk to Helen Christensen. Hi, Helen, and Jean Elmer right over here. We will point you in their direction. They'll get you all fired up, and we'll go, we'll go fill backpacks on the 5th and the 6th. All right, the last thing is Pine Cliff. We need to know, Bob, what we were saying, end of the week. Next Sunday, yeah. If it, we really need to have a collection of about, oh, somewhere between 12 and 20 if we're going to do the work that needs to be done. So Bob, Bob needs to know. And if we're not going to be there this year, which is okay, we just need to be prepared to let them know because there's a lot of work they, they will want to do and we're usually a part of that. So we're going to be a part of it next year for sure. So anyway, let Bob know, call the church office, say, hey, we're ready for a... Okay, there's a sign up on the website as well. So sign up if you'd like to go and then we'll make a decision by the end of a week from today. All right, I think that's all we've got, isn't it? Let's rise up, people. Jim, did we get online today? Uh, we're, recording. we're recording. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, Michael's going to have to find his Red Bull for the next service, I think. Oh.
Lord. Yes, yes, Lord. Amen. All right. Nicely done. And with such energy and courage, we look forward to the opportunity to claim that sense of purpose that's forged of trusting in God remembering our purpose and knowing that we've been set into this place each and every moment that exists for the opportunity to do some good. So go from this place, go in the name of the father, son of the Holy spirit, trade your sorrows for the greatest joy and share it forth so that others may do the same. Amen. Amen. One, two, three. We say yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord.